I'm grateful for the encouragement of the Holy Ghost because if I was encouraged by way of your applause, I would just walk out right now. I just say, man, wow, that was, no, don't do that now. Uh, no, 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 I'm kidding. Oh, y'all got to know me better than that. Oh. Jeez, I preach to angry faces every week. I'm used to it already. My skin's as thick as a crocodile. Be not dismayed by the look of their faces. And I learned that very early on in ministry. I've said it for years. Some of y'all are new to the ministry, but I've said it for years. You got to be a little crazy to come to this church because, man, I'm telling you, there's always some kind of challenging word that's going to go out. And you just got to. Uh, years ago, a lady came up to me after service. Uh, the, the Lord brings this to my remembrance. And she said, you know, I felt like you were throwing rocks at me. Like every time I come to church, I need to wear a helmet and I'm dodging rocks that you're throwing from the pulpit. And then she was implying that her family had, had spoken to me about all of her issues. She literally believed that someone from her family had spilled the beans about her issues. And I said, I have never heard anything from anybody in your family. This is a true story. The Lord's word was so uh, just challenging her life and situation that she said, who's been talking to you? And she thought she was serious. Did somebody from my family call you? No. But now I want to call them. Lord, so faithful and good to us. Amen. Praise God. Will you open your Bibles with me to Paul's letter to Titus? For our time together, I'd like for us to again consider the second chapter of Paul's letter to Titus. Now that the teaching has begun, please do your best to remain seated throughout the duration of the sermon. And I'm going to say this very uh, forthrightly. The preparation and time that goes into this is extensive. It's discouraging and distracting for us who prepare so uh, week in and week out to come before you, spend time in prayer to seek the mind of God, the will of God. It's not a light thing for us. So when people are moving around a lot, going and coming, it's, it, it, just, it, it feels like you give very little importance to the time that it took to go into to standing up here before you. And I'm going to tell you this, not only for my sake, Pastor Chito, Pastor Joel, the Brown Minister, well, all those that stand behind the pulpit here today, I'm telling you right now what they might not want to tell you. Every time you get up, get up, it's like you're saying what you're saying isn't important. Your time of study, prayer, preparation doesn't matter to me. Now you're saying, well, it's not all that. It is. I just wanted to throw that out there, all right? You still good? You love me still? I just want to throw that out there, yeah. All right. Titus chapter 2. Let's continue where we left off last week. I'd like to preach a message to conclude our vision series. I didn't want it to pour into February, but it did. Uh, attractive adornment. Titus chapter 2. Look at verse 4 through verse 6. I'm reading from the King James Version today. Titus chapter 2, verse 4 through 6, the word of God says, That they, now what is in parentheses is mine, all right? That they, the older women, may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, to be good, obedient to their own husbands, so that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise, Exhort them to be sober-minded or self-control. Now, I'd like for you, uh, for the sake of this service, to scroll down to verse 10, and then we'll pray, seeing the greater intention of Paul's exhortation here in verse 10. The B clause, but showing all good faith. Everybody say, good faith. faith. All right, like you're alive. Everybody say, good faith. But showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Give me grace, I pray, to preach it and teach it like you gave it to me. Give these your people an ear to hear, a heart to receive, and the grace to apply. Be glorified this morning through the proclamation of the scriptures, I pray. Challenge us that we might be changed. I ask and pray, Lord God, that the true teacher, the true preacher would come. That your Holy Spirit, Lord, would rest on us today. Lead us and guide us into all truth, that your spirit would illuminate the text, Lord, that it would come alive in our hearts. Give us grace to walk it out, and we promise to give you thanks. We ask these things in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Be seated, please.
Last week I made mention as to how it is that Titus marries the doctrine of the gospel with the duties of the gospel. Being on mission requires then that us as a church that we be mindful of our model. Paul here in his letter to Titus is exhorting uh, what we could call a twofold mandate. Um, he gives it to Titus and he lays it upon the church. The church and Titus, Titus and the church was to model. Not only model the mission, not only model the doctrine, but to teach it. When Paul writes to Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and the book of Titus, a theological trinity, if we could say, use that verbiage, he would do so. And Paul writes to Timothy, I should say, who would be the overseer of the church at Ephesus. Uh, you have to know that. Uh, Timothy, as the overseer, the pastor of the saints at Ephesus, uh, he would give, when Paul writes to Timothy, he would give Timothy the responsibility of teaching the saints at Ephesus directly. In other words, it was incumbent, it was required of Timothy to teach and preach the doctrine of God by way of the instructions for the church. The culture, the setting, and the saints of the church at Ephesus was peculiar in the sense that when Paul writes to Titus, the exhortation and how the work and demonstration, listen, of the gospel was to spread was a little bit distinct. It was different. And it's different in the sense that uh, contrary to what Paul asked Timothy to do with the saints at Ephesus, when Paul writes to Titus uh, and to the saints at Crete, the exhortation is different in the sense of there would have to be an individual education that took place among the saints. Now understand, the gospel of Jesus had come to a pagan people, a paganistic culture. They had been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ and now Titus has the mandate to shepherd, to instruct, and to lead a people who had come into the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but had come out of a pagan background. Then we see with clarity, right, the need for education and instruction. So what is unique about Paul's exhortation to Titus is this. Timothy, I want you to preach and teach it from the pulpit. Titus, I want you to teach and preach, but not only teach and preach, I need you to exhort that the older men and the older women begin to pass down to their homes, to their sons, and to their daughters, what it is that they are learning. Now, what is amazing for us and what we can automatically glean from the text is the reality of God's design that the gospel be demonstrated in this fashion, that what is intangible, what cannot be seen, what is invisible, might become visibly outwardly to those in the faith and those outside of the faith. What you profess to believe today, Christ, the gospel, has to become in some way, shape, or form tangible, palpable, and evidential to those who are outside of the faith. How then, God, are you going to display the grace and the glory of God in and through a people that are fallen by nature? And the gospel for this reason is a mystery. Not because it is beyond human comprehension, but because it is the mysterious work of God to transform sinful men in such a way that the reality of who Christ is thousands of years later is still evidenced. How, preacher? By way of a life, a home, a city, a people that have been transformed by this man named Jesus. It's one thing to say, I believe in Christ. It's another thing to walk it out in such a way that Christ is glorified and the manifold wisdom of God is put on display in such a way that people that used to know you before you came to Jesus can't help but testify that that man is no longer who he used to be. It gives credibility to the power of the gospel of Jesus. The Spirit of God takes my mind back to John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, when Lazarus comes out of the grave and many followed Jesus because there was undeniable evidence, living, breathing, moving, walking, sitting, eating amongst them. Many saw Lazarus and they believed on Christ. 
While you and I might not have come out of a literal tomb, I sense the Spirit of the Lord. While you and I were not called out of a literal, literal tomb, we were called out of the death. Oh, the death of, 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 of sin and our transgression. We were dead, Paul says, in our trespass, dead in our sins. And Christ called us like he called us. He called us by our name out of darkness into his glorious and marvelous light. You were transformed. You were changed. You're no longer who you used to be. And this is how the gospel becomes palpable evidence that Jesus is who he says he is show me a former drug addict who is now saved to the glory of God show me a man or a woman that was previously bound to alcohol methamphetamine heroin all the list from A to Z and now there's been a change a transformation the gospel of Jesus is evidence how men and women that ain't who they used to be this can't be our tia with the bad attitude what happened to the neck moving this can't be Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam, the one that came drunk before he got to the party. This ain't him. It is him. But now he's sober and he's in his right mind. What happened to Sam? He met the Christ. The gospel then is evidenced. How? In and through a life transformed and changed. So now that we've come to Christ, now that the saints at Crete had experienced the gospel of Jesus, there was yet need. What was the need? They had to be taught. They had to be taught how to walk it out, how to live it out. Doctrine married with gospel duty. Not empty knowledge, not knowledge that puffs up without the application, right? That doesn't glorify God much. It doesn't help you either. So this is a challenge for us. That we not just come to church and hear a message, hear a sermon, gain information, yet miss transformation. It was not God's design that you would come and hear sermon after sermon. In fact, Paul understood that no amount of sermons, however eloquently they might have been communicated by Titus, was going to be sufficient to bring about the transformation and the reformation in this community. I think I could say the same. And pastor, he's all right. He preaches okay, great. But no amount of sermons from this chubby preacher is going, is going to be sufficient. There has to be individual education that takes place in the home. Man, pastor, but I, that's why I come here. You help me, you help me, you help me. Right? I bring my kids here because they're bad. I mean, I love them, but they're crazy. So I bring them to youth so that you guys can fix them. Mm. I sent my wife to Bible study, so hopefully you guys can rub off on her. Oh, you'll be surprised. Man, I sent my husband because he's terrible. Hopefully you guys will help him. Okay. But no amount of Bible studies and teachings and sermons in and of themselves are going to bring about the transformation and reformation that is required. No, there has to be an individual education going on at home. You mean to tell me that you're sending your kids to youth group and they're there for 43 minutes? And you want them to be transformed when they're with you the rest of the day and the rest of the week? Not fair. Unrealistic. There's got to be a model at the home. I want you to understand, and I would say this reformation, follow me in the back, reformation and transformation in the congregation, forgive the rhythm and rhyme, <laughs> reformation and transformation in the congregation requires individual education and a consistent demonstration at home. It means you got to teach them kids at home. You gotta walk it out at the house. These people were coming from a pagan background. The, the, the women that were saved while their husbands remained unsaved, they needed encouragement. They had to be taught how to live, how to model this new reality. Listen, a Christian home in Crete was a totally new thing, just like a Christian home for you, for some of you, was a totally new thing. And this is new for us. We were born and raised this way. This is different now. I'm used to pleitos, gritos. Oh, se, se mira muy callados. I was raised in this. Now it's different. I was raised with yelling and kicking and screaming and un desorden. And now Jesus has changed my life. Ahora que, now what? We need to be taught. 
This is the heart of Paul. They were believers now. The young women had been saved out of paganism. They had to get accustomed to a whole new way. You follow me so far? Well, let's look at the text. Verse 4. Let's pick up right here. Verse 4. Man, that's, in the, that's an introduction, right? Mm. Verse 4. The text says, teach. Parenthetically, I say train because that's what it means. Teach, train. Train the young women then, the older women now. He's, Paul's giving order and instruction. I, I need the older women to train the younger women. Mm -hmm. Here it is, ladies. I need the older women to train the younger women. To do what? Or to, to be what? To be, number one, to be sober. Number two, to love their husbands. Number three, to love their children. Number four, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, to be good. Not only to love their husbands, but to be obedient to their own husbands. So that the word of God not be blasphemed. And all of this ultimately is that you and I would adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now let's go back and just dig a little bit deeper if we can. Now number one, the older women are to teach the younger women to be, number one, sober-minded. Here's the word again, sophronizo. In Greek, it means to be sober-minded, to be restored to one's senses in your right state of mind. But in this case, it also means to discipline, teach them what their duty is and to hold on to that duty. The young women are to be sober-minded. Of sound judgment. And this word is repeated over and over again. It was Paul's primary concern. Your mind's got to be right, sober. Avoid much drinking. Don't just, just, just stay away from these things that impair your ability to think clearly. Be sober-minded. Number two, teach the young women to love their husbands. The word in Greek is philandros, and that speaks to a, watch now, it means to literally to be fond of the husband, to be affectionate as a wife, and it carries with it the idea not only of a romantic love, that was not the issue here, but Paul is saying, I want you to love your husbands literally in a way that, that, that shows them and demonstrates to them that you're actually fond of the man. And I'm going to put it to you this way, para, para, para que me entienden. It ain't enough to say, well, I love him, but I don't like him. Oh, you got to like the dude. Amen. It's single awareness month, by the way, so it's good. What do you, what you mean? What, yeah, Valentine's Day is single awareness day. You're never more aware that you're single more than February 14th. Watch. Love your husband. Be fond of the man. Be affectionate. I want you to understand here that the young wife, she's determined to love her husband. Not because or not based upon a husband's worthiness, but upon God's word. Uh huh. It is God's word, not the man's worthiness in the home. No, it is God's word. In other words, she is not driven to love her husband based upon infatuation, but upon the Lord's instruction. Uh, infatuation is going to run out. I promise you, that man, yeah, he's going to get on your nerve. And that lady's going to get on your nerve sometimes. So it is not infatuation. It's not, well, I'm so enamored. No, 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 no. It is the Lord's instruction for the home. And young women had to be taught that when infatuation is running low, love that man and like that man, this is God's way. Now, they were coming from a pagan culture, one where respect and submission to the man as the head of the house was not practiced or easily or readily evidenced in the house. So this was drastically different for these women. They had to be taught to love their children and to love their husbands. Now, if we were to take a survey in the world, these things appear to be natural, right? You can ask any lady on the street that's a mama. They don't need to be a believer. You ask them, hey, you, you a mom? Yeah, I'm a mom. Do you love your kids? And what are most ladies going to say? Yeah, I love my kids, but Paul is not talking about natural affection. No, it's deeper than that because those in the world can say, I love my children with a natural affection. I love them, but that does not mean that they love them in a way that, is, that cares or in a way that is concerned for their spiritual well-being. 
In other words, it's possible for the world to say, I love my kids and I want the best for them. That means, well, as long as they got a roof over their head, if there's money in their bank, then I'm glad for them. They might, and I sense the Lord's unction behind me now. Your children might have a roof over their heads. They might be college educated. They might have a great life, entre comillas. They might be culturally accepted. They might be climbing that corporate ladder. But what is it? what do they gain in reality if they live in a nice neighborhood, have a bank account full of money? If they do not know Christ, they are beggars and paupers. And so wanting the well-being for my children, it goes beyond where they live, beyond how much money they make, beyond where they're at in their career. My, the, my children, I need to know that they serve the living God. What good is it for my daughter to graduate? And by the way, she's about to graduate from the university, Lord willing, in a matter of months. But it does me no good as her father to say my child is a college graduate if she denies the Christ. No, their well-being begins with the salvation of their soul. Natural affection is not enough because the book of Proverbs chapter 13 reminds us that a parent that does not discipline their child hates their child. It's possible for them to say my baby is doing good. She got a nice ride, a nice house and everything's together. But if they do not know Jesus, you're not loving them rightly. Love your children and love your husband. Shout hallelujah if you're in the building still. It's different than natural affection. They're commanded love your children. Be attached. Put it up there, baby. It means to be attached to their children. Now, let me just pause right here and give, give, give clarity. There are nuances to this. I'm not telling you that you need to be, that they need to be your chicle, like someone said, for I know my children are my chicles. That means that they're stuck to you. In fact, some of y'all need to, kind of, they're a little bit too stuck. And let me digress to last week. You're still cutting their weenie and they're 32. Love their children. The idea in the Greek is to be attached, to be affectionate, not with a foolish, loose, and ungoverned affection. And this is what we see in the world. A loose, ungoverned affection. But this kind of love speaks to the real good, not a temporal good only, but spiritual and their eternal well-being. I want you to understand, this goes beyond what is natural to Beyond what is natural, it's a work of God's spirit. And I digress to the onset. What, how, where is the gospel made visible? Our culture is not, our culture in the United States is not only pagan. But it is opposed to God's standard and design for the family unit. Women in today's culture are encouraged, they're convinced that feminism is, is the way. They hear words like submission and obedience and they resist because they've been taught by today's culture that that's not what it means to be strong. And the reality is it is God's design. And by the way, consider the following. When the word of God clashes with cultural norms, it is incumbent upon us to recognize and to say, while this might be hard for me, I have two choices. I can get mad at God and say, I disobey. But in doing so, I reveal my foolishness and folly. Am I able to say or to disagree with the God who is infinitely wise, infinitely powerful, and who created all things? Or better yet, or worse yet, do you believe that your way is better than the God who made it all? Because any rebellion to God's word ultimately is you and I believing, well, I, I know what God said, but I think my way is better. Good luck with that. It's rebellion. It's rebellion to God's way. It's us telling the infinitely wise God that you know better. Now we're inclined, right? Sometimes we're like, I know what it says, but it's better to yield by the grace of God and say, Lord, you are infinitely wise. And this is your model and way. Give us grace then to walk in it and to trust that you, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God, know that your way is better than my way. Because there's safety in God's way. Ah, I wish I had a church. There is safety there. There's protection there. There's provision there. Now, God could have chosen a litany of ways to demonstrate these things. But instead, he, he, he reveals the glory, his wisdom, the wisdom of God, the glory of God, the grace of God. Ah, 
Ah, the providence of God, the, pre, the preordained uh, path of the believer, revealing constantly and strategically a God who is infinitely aware of my shortcomings. And so he has designed the gospel in such a way that all credit would be ascribed not to men, but to the God who created man. That all glory would not be laid at my feet, no, but that the glory would be given to the Lamb of God. Yeah, that God would be glorified in and through the salvation of men and women who come from pagan backgrounds. That God would be glorified in the salvation and transformation in men and women like you and I. Some of you came in here dragging your feet, drunken in your state, inebriated, drug addicted. No, but now to the glory of God and to the praise of his grace, you've been saved and washed in the blood of the lamb you're no longer who you used to be and this is the wisdom of God on display to a lost and a dying world now your home that was broken has been restored I wish I had a church in here now there is evidence that God is infinitely wise that your way got you in a mess but the Lord's grace pulled you up out of that hole now you can testify that he deserves all the glory and the honor and the praise it wasn't Dr feel that got you out it was the master that redeemed your life it wasn't the wisdom of your abuelo it was the wisdom of the all-knowing God that led to your transformation it was Jesus that changed your life shout hallelujah I don't like what God says get mad at God take it up with him and tell him your way is better let's move on it's Gil that says, amidst all the fondness of natural affection, a parent might be said to hate the child. No, it's deeper than that. Now look at verse 5. The exhortation continues. And ladies, don't get discouraged because it seems initially that Paul is leaning heavier, uh, I should say, on the women and the young women, right? But don't get discouraged, right? We'll get there in just a moment. But because you have to understand that, it, that scripture has to be interpreted systematically. That means that it is what God's word reveals as a whole. We don't isolate what he's writing here in this particular chapter. We don't forget what he has called the man to do and what the man is called to be. But for the sake of our text, let's stick to the context. Are you alive? Shout amen. Man, pastor was just picking on us today and the young women. What about the men? We know what God requires of the men too. But for the sake of our time remaining, let's look at verse 5. Now help me read it. Ready? Con ganas. Ready? Read. To be... I only have women waiting. Men, feel free to join along. Ready? Read. To be. Uh huh. It's getting dimmer and dimmer. Wait a minute. It's getting dimmer and dimmer. Like, I ain't reading this today, Pastor. No. I'm going to remain seated out of respect to you, but I ain't reading. All right? Come on, everybody together. Ready? Read. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient. That the. All right, let's begin. Discreet means to be, again, same word in Greek, sober-minded. Be discreet. Number two, teach the young women to be chaste. Agnos. Here's a word we don't hear much in this generation. To be chaste. Teach the young women to be reverent. Here it is, ladies. Help me here. To be... Um, I was jokingly saying I should have had Brother Ken teach this because he has a nice smile and he just has a way about it, you know, like... Be chaste, be modest, pure from carnality. I was talking to the first service, you know, I have two daughters. I've gone shopping with them so many times. And dad, I want to go to this store, and there we go. You know, one of them is like Brandy, um, Brandy, Brandy uh, something, Malone or Brand, Brandy, I don't know. And so we walk in because that's what the young, you know, people, her A's, they're, they're, they're buying, or Brandy, hey, Elder Brown, you know the store? Oh, I'm asking, you're older than me, you don't know. Uh, We've gone into the store, we'll walk in, right, and she'll, she'll look around at the clothes and stuff, and then she'll be, and so I'm casually looking at the clothes too, right, just looking at them, she'll, she'll come up and like, mm, she'll find something, right, and she'll, Dad, what do, you, what do you think? And I'll look at it like, where's the rest of the shirt? <laughs> well, you know, Dad, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a crop top. It, it's, it's like that. That's how it is. You, so it show, yeah, it just, it's it just, it's, it's a peekaboo top. <laughs> I need the help right now, some of y'all saints. 
peek-a-boo, peek-a-hoo. Uh, I'm preaching better than your amen. I said, peek a what? And, and who's peeking? Oh, this is good. Uh-huh. Uh, so what do you think, Dad? Well, you know, because it's a style, Dad, right? It's, 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 it's Brandy Malone or Brandy McIntyre, whatever, right? Right, right, Dad? And, and so, so look at me and I'll just say, No. And, and, and this is what I learned after first service. I'm ready. And no in Spanish is no. A little bit faster on the intonation, but it's the same, right? In English, no. In Espanol, no. And let me encourage the young women, you don't have to show what it is that God has created you to get whatever God gave you. You don't need to advertise it for men that don't love you. I wish somebody would help me in here. Can we make modesty cool again? Come on, this is, the, this is not the beauty that God created you to show. You ain't got to advertise all that. Shout hallelujah. Be modest. We live in an immodest culture. Carl's Jr. years ago tried to sell us a double cheeseburger with half-naked women on a hot rod. What does that have to do with the double Western bacon? Which I love, by the way. As you can see. Not as much, but I love the double Western. I got a lady on that car, the, the hood of the car. I don't need that. You don't, I don't need that, Tino. I'm going to buy the burger because I want the meat and bacon. We live in a culture that is immodest and that encourages impure, impurity amongst the young women. So they need training. Teach them not to show anything. Ain't no peekaboo going on. Be chased. Number three, keepers at home. Keepers at home. That means they need to be taught how to care for the house. This is countercultural. Teach them how to be keepers for and of the house, working at home. Pastor, there are nuances here too. I'm not saying, ladies, quit your job and stay home. I'm not telling you that. What I am saying is that it is God's design that the lady be able to care for her house. In what way, Pastor, that she make her home beautiful and pleasant for the family? Now, my grandfather, I can hear his consejo right now. He would say, Ronan, if you live in a box under a tree somewhere, Make sure that the presence of the Lord reign in that home, that there be the peace of God in that house. Here's the idea, ladies, that you might be keepers of the home, that it would be a place where your husband and family can come and find the peace of God and, and pleasantry there. You don't have to be rich. It's not about furniture that's fancy. It's not about your decorations. It's that your home would be a place that is pleasant to land. But man wants to come home to strife, disorder. Is there a flash flood warning going on right now? Is, uh, is there an uh, amber alert? It's going to come out on the live stream. Maybe we can edit that out. I don't know. Is anybody missing a child here this morning? No? Keepers of the home. I've been telling I, I, I've been having this conversation in my own house, just so you know that this isn't just laid on you. My daughter's real soon; they're going to be married off. My youngest daughter is convinced that she's not never going to leave home. She says this. <laughs> Y'all are laughing. Pray for me. <laughs> my youngest daughter, bless her heart, she says, "Dad, I'm never leaving," and I'm just thinking to myself, <laughs> "Yes, you will." <laughs> well, you going, bro? <laughs> Glory to Jesus. No, but she'll say, I'm never getting married. I'm never leaving, Dad. I'm just like, <laughs> no, you leaving. <laughs> I like it here. I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't pay for anything. You don't pay for rent. No, all you got to worry about is paying for your Chick-fil-A nuggets. Nah, bro. <laughs> you going to learn. But my concern for her, real talk, all joking aside, is we need to teach her right now. She is, she is a young adult. Yeah, we need, to, we, we, we need to continue to teach her how to do what? How to keep a house. You don't have to agree with your past. You can call me radical, old-fashioned. I don't care much, to be frank with you. She needs to be taught how to keep a home. 
And this is not about the du particular duties of a man in a house. If a man wants to sweep, help do it. That's none of my business. This is about the ability of the woman to keep a house in a way that honors God and honors those who live there. That's right. Keep a home. They need to be taught that, though. Not by the world. Show women how to do two things. Number one, love their children and love their husbands. And this love is going to be demonstrated by respect and submission to their husband. Now, that's antiquated. This is how they're going to demonstrate because there was a fear. Look, look at me, church. I'm almost done. There was this fear that the women would come to Christ, believe the gospel, and then neglect what was at home. There was this fear that they would embrace the gospel, be transformed, but if their husband remained unconverted, they'd neglect the house. And I've seen this happen through the years. The wife radically saved, changed to the glory of God, but now the man can't get a sack lunch. So Paul, listen, you laugh, but Paul is saying no. Lest they blaspheme the gospel of God, and lest they criticize this gospel work, Make sure, ladies, that you tend to the house. Love your husband, obey your own husband, and love them kids. So as to not give them an opportunity to profane the name of Christ. In other words, you're going to go to Bible study? Go to Bible study. That's great. Make sure that your husband's stomach is full. Three amens. That's all right. Tell him, baby, I left everything right there. I, I'm going to be at church from this time to that time. But honey, bunny, I promise you, the food's already there. Your favorite. And when I get home from Bible study, I'm going to give you that foot rub. Don't trip. I got you. <laughs> Brothers, I'm sorry. No, none of the ladies said amen. Oh, Lord, help you. <laughs> Keepers at home. Now, Ellicott puts it this way. And as I close, there should be no desire, no attempt to go around to other houses and so contracting idle, gossiping habits. Pastor Ronan says it this way. Tend to your house. Tend to your house. The current culture of social media has allowed us to glimpse into the windows of other people's houses. To our own peril, by the way. What they got going on, tend to your house. Well, look, I see him and he takes her out. They didn't post the fight on the way to the restaurant, and the fight on the way home, I sense, I sense God in here. They, they checked in at Morton's. They didn't post the madness, the melee after Morton's. Because people don't post and share their struggles and their realities. They only post their highlight reels. So that you can believe that everything is copacetic. If you only knew that they need Christ more than the couple that you might not see on socials. We need the Lord. Tend to your house. Look at your neighbor and say, tend to your house. Come on, tell them like you mean to say, tend to your house. Lastly, be obedient to their husbands. Submission speaks to God's order of rank. Listen, submission is not a bad word in the church. God's order. Submission is not a matter of superiority or inf inferiority. It's a matter of rank. It's a military word. The husband is to be the head of the wife, like Christ is the head of the church. Non-negotiable. This is God's design and his wisdom. Now, that doesn't mean that the man is superior to the lady. Oh, no, let me pause right here for station identification. Brothers, you know. Some of y'all married a woman that's way smarter than you. Where would you be if it wasn't for that lady that the Lord sent you? And I need the brothers to stop right here and say, thank God for the wife that the Lord gave me. Where would I be if it would come out? Chito, you need to raise both hands, my brother. I'm trying to help you out. Now, where would I be? Thank you, brother. I'm trying to help you. Amen. Where would I be if it had my wife? No, some of y'all to thank God. It's not a matter of superiority and inferiority. No, some of y'all brothers, you'd be lost. God saw the man alone and said, it ain't good for this dude to be by himself. I need to make him a hell. He needs he needed. He needed. He still needs. Thank God for the lady that the Lord gave. Thank God for her. It's not a matter of superiority or inferiority. It's a matter of rank and order. 
in equal in personhood, different in role and rank. And that's God's wisdom. To the world, no. But in the house of God and by the word of God, yes. Be obedient to their own husbands. Now lastly, verse 6 says, And teach the young men likewise. Exhort them to be sober-minded. Here we are again, Paul. And teach the young men. They're full of vigor. They have energy. They're prone to be loose in their living. Teach them not to be given to drunkenness, to be sober in their minds. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, let them be old when they're young so that they may be young when they're old. Younger men should be sensible, setting a godly example so that others, here it is, so that others would be attracted to our Savior. Ah, and as Paul proceeds, I need you to hear me now. As Paul proceeds, we see the consummation of his exhortation to Titus. What's the end game? What, what, what is God's design here? What is the wisdom in these teachings and, and, and how we are to pass down what God has instructed us and shown us? This is a new way of life for us. And Paul in verse 10, the B clause, he reveals to us this reality. Ready? This is the expected end. This is the intended end for us as a church and as a people. Even in the year of our Lord, this is still the mandate and the mission. This is the model. This is what we model and this is what we teach because typically in the evangelical church please allow me this liberty when there is the presence of a model there might be the lacking of teaching there might be a lack of teaching and sometimes there is presence of teaching but there is not a significant model and it is the will of God that we do both it's both and not either or there are some that are big on teaching and they don't model what it is that God has called them to walk out there are others that don't have an issue with a model but they lack teaching and when we can marry the two when we have the doctrine of the gospel mixed with the duties of the gospel then we are able watch now to display the wisdom of God to a lost and a dying world. If there was ever a time that America needed to see what a family looks like, where the man is the head of the house and leading and loving his wife sacrificially, it's right now. If there's ever a time when young women need to be taught modesty to cover up whatever it is that they're trying to show by way of peekaboo television, peekaboo clothes and everything of that matter, if there was ever a time that feminist ideologies had to be done away with, it is right now that men ought to be taught that it's alright to be a man a man of strength, a man that has a backbone, a man of God, a man of the word, a man of doctrine, a man that displays the reality of the gospel of Jesus. Is there not a need in our culture now that young women will be able to model the reality of who Jesus is? It's, and this is how what is on the inside becomes evident. And Paul would call it this. He would say this is the adornment. And that word adorn, Paul says in verse 10, the B clause, but showing all. I wish I had a church that would help me preach now. But showing all good faith so that in every thing they may what they may adorn everybody shout adorn uh, that they may adorn the what the doctrine of God our savior here it is how do you wear how do you adorn because the word adorn in Greek is the word cosmeo and it's where we get our English word cosmetic it means to ornament it means to decorate how is the believer decorated yes how is the believer dressed how is the believer how does he display the goodness of God the grace of God the reality of the gospel it's by adorning it's by putting on it's by being dressed by with what with the doctrine of the of God our Savior and it's through the doctrine of God that the goodness of God is put on display wives submitting to their husbands husbands loving their wives children respecting their parents and honoring their parents and this is the reality that God has intended and designed for us as a church and as a body that we would demonstrate his infinite wisdom in a world that's going to hell in a handbasket how by putting on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that when the world sees you they would see the glory of God's wisdom his grace and his goodness it might not look good initially but once they peek in and see you're going to be able to testify God has changed me from the inside out and this is a testimony that Jesus is who he says he is can I get another minute here shout amen it's the apostle Paul then who depicts this he depicts the reality he let me slow down it's Paul it's Paul yes it's Paul it's Paul with great succinction with great precision with great with, with, with great detail it's Paul that demonstrates 
demonstrates to us this, 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 this reality of the gospel, how it becomes manifest. And Paul uses, Paul uses a metaphor, uh-huh. Paul uses metaphoric language to describe for us how the gospel becomes palpable. Uh, he says things like this. Ready? Here it is. And I close. Paul would use this metaphor in a variety of ways, different reasons, different settings, same spirit. The apostle Paul, when he writes to the church in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3, he says, those that are in Christ. Yes, everybody shout in Christ. Paul says, help me those that are in Christ. Everybody shout in Christ. He says, those that are in Christ have put on Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 3, those that are in Christ have put on Christ Jesus. Paul writes to the church at Colossae. In Colossians chapter 3, he says, you have put on, I like that, you have put on the new man. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed after the very image of your creator. Help me, Lord. In Ephesians chapter 4, the apostle Paul says, you were taught to what? To put on the new self. And not only were we taught to put on the new cell we were taught in like manner to put off the old cell and so the apostle Paul uses this to display the gospel are you here here it is ready put on Jesus and put off sin there is a putting on and there is a putting off in other words how do we adorn the doctrine of God by putting on Jesus help me bring it home now how do we demonstrate to a world that Jesus is the savior by putting on Jesus and putting off the old man shout hallelujah that's what Paul would say to us today. Put on. Oh, somos revestidos con Cristo Jesús. Somos, somos criaturas nuevas a través del Evangelio. Dios nos ha cambiado. Dios me ha transformado. Y yo testifico, aleluya, un mundo perdido. Que Él es el camino, la verdad y la vida. Y yo a través de un testimonio, oh, a través, a través de mi vida, puedo testificar que hay un Cristo que sana. Hay un Cristo que salva. Y hay un Cristo que restaura. Alguien grita, ¡Gloria a Dios! Someone turned on the switch of Spanish buzz light here. I don't know what happened. <laughs> El vaquero. Uh, yeah, it's, it's through this putting on of Christ. Mm. It's this putting on of Christ. It's this putting off of the old man. Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, Galatians 3. You've been taught what, Paul, to put on. You've been taught what, Paul, to put off. Take off the old man. Hello, Crete. Hello, Titus. Teach the old men and the old women to teach the younger men and the younger women that they might put off Julian, the old man, and put on Christ. You see that? When you got up today, some of y'all put on a coat. And just like we get dressed, just like we adorn ourselves with outward adornment, the desire of God and the design of God is that we would put on Christ in such a way that the world who is lost and dying would see such a radical transformation in you, normal men, normal women. But boy, they're not the same. There's a change. There's something desirable about That they would see you adorned with what? The doctrine of God our Savior. That this would be the adornment of this church. This would be a people on mission. A people on mission display the goodness of God. How? By way of the doctrine of God our Savior. That's how. Put on Jesus. Put off the old man. How often? Every day. I put on Jesus. I'm not who I used to be. I put on Jesus. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, glory to God. He is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So teach them now. Now that they're new, teach them how to walk. Teach them how to marry the doctrine of the gospel with the duties of the gospel teach them how to walk it out in such a way that the world might see and behold listen not your greatness but the greatness of God not your wisdom but the wisdom of God and as the days grow darker the wisdom of God shines brighter look at pastor I gotta let you go as the days grow darker the wisdom of God shines brighter antiquated in this culture for sure it's only going to get oh man the world's going to look at it and just y'all are weird 
It's all right. I'd rather be weird, Sister Barbara, to someone that doesn't know God. Because I know that eventually they're going to see God's wisdom in what they call weird and strange. And they'll see the beauty of Christ in God's way and God's order. Put on Jesus. Can the church say amen here this morning? This is the exhortation. This is the reality of the message today. Adorn. Put it on. Stand to your feet. I'm done. In other words, dress yourself in the doctrine of God. Put it up there. Hallelujah. I'm real tight, frugal, some things. I, don't hate me for this. Uh, just don't, don't get mad at me. You won't. But some of you are tight like me. But uh, I've always had it. I, I've always struggled. And if, there are every peop- if there's anyone in service industry here, just hear me out. Uh, forgive me. Give me grace today. I always struggle with tipping big. I do. When I get great service, I have no issue tipping. But even though I tip them, is it as good as it probably could be? No. Anybody else like that here? Am I the only one? Stephen's the only one? Thank you, Brother Cole. I appreciate that. Everybody else looks like they want to kill us, though, brother. So maybe let's just walk out together. <laughs> it's this thing. Like, I'm just like, man, you know, tipping, tipping. I give God the tithe and offering. Like, so, man, you want me to tip you 20%? That's tough for me. But sometimes the Lord will come and say, I want you to tip that person big. Right? And I start arguing with, with God because obviously God doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so I start telling God, what, what, man, what, 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 what? Service wasn't even all that. Lord, it's not wise for me to tip him because his service wasn't that good. And then he's going to think that it was good. And then I'm doing him harm in the long run. I'm, I'm just trying to inform God as to the error of his way. Right? God, oh, you're missing it on him. Then he's going to think it's good. And then, no, 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 no. Better to get a bad tip so he can learn his lesson. And the Lord says, no, give him. And not too long ago, I went to go eat. And the Lord said, do it. Give him a big tip. I didn't want to do it, Chito. Tacos weren't that good. Service wasn't that great. The Lord said, do it. I did it. I was it by myself. I did it. Right? Listen to this. So after tipping him, whatever, after arguing with God, I gave the man whatever tip the Lord told me to give him, which was far too much that I, I was. So I didn't leave happy about it, but I did it. So as I'm walking out, the man comes. He gets the thing. He looks at it. I walk out towards the register, grumpy. And he comes up to me and says, hey, Thank you. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> what does that mean? I, I, don't worry about it. It's me and God. I said, no, 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 no. And he says, you're pastor, right? My aunt and cousin go to your church. They've been visiting. And I saw you on YouTube. <laughs> so, right, it, it goes from... <laughs> to, yes, I am. Come and visit sometime. <laughs> We're open letters. And as cliche as it might be to some, I'm compelled to tell you before I pray, some folks are reading you. In fact, most are. Live in such a way that the folks that are reading you would say, I need that. 
I want that. Give me Jesus. Father, we lift our hands in need of your grace. I ask and pray that you would help us this week. Mm. That we would be adorned with the doctrine of God our Savior. When we're given to forget that we're on mission at, at the workplace, at home, with our kids, in a culture that is anti-God, by your grace, remind us, Lord, that we are on mission always. Always on mission. Help us to model and to teach. Help us to teach and to model. Both and help us by your grace. That we would testify to the grace and the wisdom of an all-knowing God. In a culture that is contrary and hostile to it, help us to model the goodness of the doctrine of God our Savior. So with our hands raised to heaven, I pray, may the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all God's people until we meet again, either here in glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. The church said amen. Can you glorify the Lord this morning? God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night, Lord willing.